Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition of SFU Vancouver's Lunch and Learn. My name is Laurie Anderson, and I'm the executive director of the Vancouver campus of SFU. And on behalf of my colleagues who I work with on Lunch and Learn, Flavio, Claudia, and Sophie, I want to welcome you to this event. The Vancouver campus of SFU is actually nine separate locations spread out across the downtown. And I want to acknowledge that all of them are on the unceded lands of the Coast Salish First Peoples, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Now, we have three goals for the Lunch and Learn program, similar to the other programs that we do from the downtown campus. One is that we want to mobilize knowledge. And by that, we mean we want to share expertise with people in our internal community and, of course, outside. The second goal is to mobilize knowledge. That is, we want to bring people together, share knowledge and understanding, raise awareness, and in the process, help solve some pressing issues. And the final goal we have is, of course, engaging with the community. And today is a classic example of that. People keep coming in. We had 174 people, sorry, 178 people for this. And I think we've got well over 100 mm -hmm. Finders now for that. Now, what I, I want to do before we go any further, I want to thank the people who will be speaking today. First of all, from the Falls Creek South community, Maria, Sharon, and Richard, I, I want to thank you in advance for stepping up to speak on behalf of your community. I also want to mention someone else from the Falls Creek South community who has played a big part in planning this with our team, and that is Nathan Edelson. So thank you so much to Nathan for all of the work he's done behind the scenes. And of course, I want to thank our guest moderator today, Isla, who's brought his time, his expertise, and his experience to bear on the future and the present situation of Falls Creek South. And I want to thank him so much for that. So just before I hand it over to Larry, I want now to just tell you a little bit about Larry Beasley, and then I'll hand things over to him. And again, thank you all for showing up today for SFU Vancouver's Lunch and Learn. So as many of you know, Larry was the chief planner for the city of Vancouver. He's also an urban designer, a teacher, and an author. He is a distinguished practice professor at UBC in their School of Community and Regional Planning founding member, founding principal of Beasley & Associates, and as I've mentioned, of course, uh, for many years, the chief planner for the city of Vancouver. Larry has, an, has many appointments, including the TransLink boards here in the Lower Mainland, the National Capital Commission in Ottawa, the Green Line Transit Project in Calgary, and the International Ec Economic Advisory Committee in Rotterdam, as just a few examples. Larry, of course, has worked in cities around the world in a number of assignments that have been characterized as game-changing in revitalizing cities around the globe, including Abu Dhabi, Moscow, Dallas, cities across Scandinavia and all across Canada. Larry has, is the author of two popular books, Eco Design for Cities and Suburbs, and his most recent publication, Vancouverism, which speaks to the revitalization model that Larry was instrumental in bringing to here in Vancouver. Larry's received many, many recognitions and awards, including several honorary doctorates, the Kevin Lynch Prize from MIT, the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal, and he's also a recipient of the Order of Canada. But I'll close by telling you that Larry's proudest accomplishments are his two degrees from Simon Fraser University, his BA in political science, and most recently, his honorary doctorate for his lifelong contribution to urban design planning and the revitalization of cities. So thank you all for showing up, and I'll now hand things over to our guest moderator, Larry. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction, and hello to everyone. I'm very honored today to host a conversation with three people who are at the very heart of a big drama that's unfolding in one of Vancouver's most interesting neighborhoods, Falls Creek South, which 
as many of you, most of you know, is the south side of the creek, uh, just on the other side from downtown Vancouver. This is a leasehold neighborhood developed in the 70s and the 80s, which is now being considered for a whole new future as the leases start to become due for renewal. And our guests are today are residents who are going to tell you about this community, but also about what they're seeing and feeling with all the change that's happening and starting even in their community. And then SFU will be asking the city, who, are, who is the landlord, the owner of the land, to join with other community leaders in a few weeks to, so the city can then tell what they are going to do in terms of plans and policies for the future of the area. I will start by introducing our guests, uh, and I'll do that in the order in which they're going to speak. And then after I set the stage, each of them will have about five minutes to tell you their part of the story, their side of the story. And then for the rest of the hour, what we want to do is have your questions and comments come into this so that we can have a real community conversation. And I know all of our guests are looking forward to that community conversation. I'll start with Sharon Yandel. Uh, she'll be our speaker. Sharon is on the board of the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association. And she produces their bi-weekly publication. It's a very popular one in the neighborhood called Between the Bridges. She's lived in Falls Creek in two different strata leasehold enclaves since 1996. Uh, she's a labor relations narrator, an arbitration advocate, and a consultant with many public and private organizations and has authored numerous uh, studies and reports in her field. And she has many awards, many awards. And she's also taught at the University of Victoria and has been a Senate member at SFU. Very important, I think, to today's uh, event. Sharon will then turn it over to Richard Marchant. He is the president of the Falls Creek South Replans Strata Leaseholder Society which is the bargaining unit for about two thirds of the strata leaseholder uh, are in the community. He's lived in Falls Creek since 2014 when he said to me, he and his wife were fortunate enough to move into the Creek Village strata. Uh, Richard has education in engineering and business and his, uh, his professional experience encompasses the utilities and transportation sectors both internationally and nationally. And before retiring recently, Richard was the senior executive at Hydro. And last but certainly not least is Maria Roth. Maria is the co-chair of what's called the All Co-ops Working Group. Maria is a member of the Falls Creek Housing Co-op, but she's also lived in the Greater Vancouver Floating Homes Co-op and the Creek View Co-op. Uh, having come to Falls Creek South to live in 1997. Maria is educated in social science at UBC, but for the past 15 years, Maria has been working from home as an independent designer maker while she's been raising her two children. Maria has been a very housing volunteer and advocate because of her own challenging experiences before she found the co-op movement. Uh, with experiences of homelessness, group homes, as well as living in one of the smallest legal homes, as she said it to me, uh, in Vancouver, 125 square feet. So those would be our speakers. Uh, let me just start, though, by giving a bit of an overview of this community. Falls Creek South started really as one of the most important early planning experiments in modern Vancouver history. Back in the 1970s, when the city said no to freeways, it also said, you know, people, more people, sh however, should be living downtown, close to work, close to jobs and other things. And this vast, obsolete industrial edge just on the south side of the creek, the council of the day said, this is a perfect place for these new people to live. They also decided at that time that this should be a place for the latest innovative thinking in city building, community building. So as the neighborhood came together following a very innovative 1972 plan that was really inspired by the great Walter Hardwick, 
what do we what did we see? We saw a conference of development, not too dense, but very well organized. We saw a framework of neighborhood enclaves, nicely scaled, everything close together so people could really relate to one another as neighbors. We saw a kind of a shunning of the car. A little later, a few years later, some parking was added, but still it's an area where there are not a lot of cars. Uh, and we saw lavish parks and, uh, and amenities. And we saw the first real manifestation outside of, uh, of uh, downtown Vancouver and, and, and Stanley Park of the wonderful seawall walkway, that stone seawall and the wonderful walkway bikeway, which as we all know has become one of the most important and beloved amenities in our city. But the biggest experiment was really the social mix. It was one third low income, one third middle income, one third higher income, very integrated living. And we had never tried that before in our city. And frankly, I can say, having been in, uh, in the planning department for over 30 years, we've never achieved it since, this wide and complete uh, mix. We've been focusing in the last few years on more low income housing security and let the rest let, uh, have the market do what it could do. And we now know that that was a problem, that this idea from the 70s was a great idea. The second biggest experiment was to lease this public land rather than to sell it. And the outcome of that experiment is really what we're talking about today. So back then they said, you know, would this all work? Could it stay together over time? Well, we're now 40 plus years later. And the answer is a big yes on both counts. This is a world model that is referenced as best practice in neighborhood building everywhere. Where if, if I'm Scandinavia, we talk about it. If I'm in Australia, we talk about it. And we know even in our city that it's even more important today because of the current challenges we face, like home security, affordability, cost of community infrastructure, reuse of resources, all of the issues that matter in the modern city. Today, this community is real, it's lively, it's a remarkable, uh, livable place, and it's proved to be amazingly resilient. Everything is close by and convenient. Residents really work together with mutual support and assistance right across those traditional social barriers, and they are a very well-organized community. And then it has this amazing stability. And imagine what that means to the two-thirds of the residents who would not in any way find security or this ability and quality of place to live within their price range in our city in at any location. And even remember this, that the leasehold stratas are more affordable than comparable private market condos. Experts, it's maybe as much as 25% more affordable. Tomorrow, this community sees itself as continuing to evolve and it wants to be inclusive. It wants to make room for more people. It wants to be diverse. Uh, it wants to share the dream. That's the word the residents have used for that. There are no nimbyism, no, nimby, no nimbies in this community that I have found so far in talking to many, many people. And this community has put that down on paper in various plans to, of how to expand their community as a model for other communities in Vancouver going forward. So this is an extraordinary place with extraordinary residents, as you're going to hear in just a minute or so. And it reminds me of several planning principles, which I can say as an urbanist, I have used throughout my career, and which I think every urbanist uses. Livability and residence here in spades. Shouldn't that be protected as the gold standard for modern planning? Secure affordability. But you know, is that security really evaporating before our very eyes every day with the running out of these leases? Can't security be guaranteed right up front? Sustainability is no question about the environmental responsibility of this community. And they want to make that even more as they move forward. Of course, collaborative planning. I've heard uh, stories about closed door meetings and thinking and decisions. Instead, shouldn't this be a community that is transparently embraced, taking them up on their offer to, to work with the landlord and the government, that is to say the city 
uh, in planning for the future. To me, I hope that these are the city's principles. I have heard stories that these are actually debatable issues and choices that are in the commentary so far. Let's explore them with our residents, our three residents, through the stories that they are going to tell us today. So Sharon, why don't you start the community narrative with your part of the story? Thank you so much, and thank you for that ter terrific overview. If I had to describe false growth in one word, that word would be one that you just use, Larry, and integrate it. And there are three different ways in which the community is integrated. The first is the physical integration that results from the original brilliant design in which the enclaves, which are the residential complex in this uh, community, are seamlessly integrated with each other in, the, in their courtyard pathways in this primarily walkable community in which, which was never built around a car and hope will be. But there's all an organizational integration that took place right from the beginning. Through the city in 1976, the uh, residents of the time formed the Falls Creek South Neighborhood Association. And this is unique among such associations. There are no individual members. The members of the association are in fact these enclaves and the stratas and the co-ops. And each uh, of these enclaves um, as delegates to monthly association meetings and have been doing so for 45 years. Furthermore, each enclave funds the association on a so much per door basis. And that funding derives from line items in their annual budgets. And the association deals with everything pertaining to a community. Uh, we recently have ex changed our constitution to incorporate representation from the other nonprofit uh, enclaves and also are doing so in order to accommodate tenants associations in anticipation of an increase in renters in the community. But the most important element of the integration is income or the social integration. And it's one thing to have a mix of incomes, and we do, but it's another thing to integrate that mix. And I found a, a great illustration of this in a novel I was reading recently. And I'd like to uh, read one paragraph from this. The protagonist is out of province, <coughs> excuse me, a woman who is staying briefly in the Granville Island Hotel. She goes for a walk on the seawall and writes this. There is a feeling of unreality to this place. The cupped and gentled oak, the manicured path, its little lookouts and cul-de-sacs with their strategically planted rocks. Everything whispers of wealth. She guesses she could afford to live here for what? Six months? Doesn't matter. The day would come when she would have nothing left. If uh, what she does not know, if she took a step away from the seawall and toward the residences that she thinks she would go broke living in, is that on these city lands, two thirds of the housing enclaves are non moral And as Larry had mentioned, even the market stratas uh, historically trade at significantly less than if she walks the 15 minute route that I take from my place to Granville Island, through the courtyards and along the pathway, she would pass through two non-market rentals, four market stratas, two special needs enclaves and three co-ops. And if she were walking with me, that 15 minute walk might take an hour because in this way, the physical and organizational and social integration is reinforced among residents every single day because the entire design of the community facilitates people bumping into each other. More important than that is as she passes through these enclaves, she would not be able to tell which was which. And just as there are no poor doors here and there are no poor floors here, no poor enclaves. There are no brownie points for living in a market strata there are no demerits for living in a co-op or a non-market. 
it doesn't matter. Nobody cares because nothing turns on it. This physical organization, organization and social organization has led to a very strong, stable and supportive community and one with room to grow. We know we can double the population without destroying the neighborhood we want to do. If integrated is the first word that, that comes to my mind when I describe Falls Creek South. Today, the last word I would use is stable because the stability and the support that people feel here and the security is disappearing rapidly as the situation of the very unstable uh, leases and the uncertainties in the uh, deriving from the uh, city's uh, apparent uh, inability or unwillingness to seriously extend the leases or deal with the leases in, uh, in such a way to retain the, this community that those of us who live here uh, live, love so much and want to extend and expand to others. And hopefully we will get into that uh, discussion. And I would pass this on now to uh, Richard Marchand. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And thanks to Simon Fraser University for hosting this opportunity. I'll speak about the leasehold stratus play as part of this highly successful mixed tenor community that Larry and Sharon have described so well, but also about the challenges they face and the opportunity that but first, just a little bit of background. There are 13 leasehold strata enclaves with 669 residential strata units, which is about a third of the homes on city-owned land at Falls Creek South. In case it seems low to you, if you've walked from the Canby to the Broad Bridge, it's important to know there are also 1,100 freehold sites on privately held land. The original existing strata leases are for 60 years. The existing leases end beginning in 2036 through 2046, as little as 15 years from now. I'll speak to the implications of shrinking time frame later in these notes. Under the existing leases, the city, as the landlord, can unilaterally extend the lease at any time. And the existing lease sets out the methodology and process for determining market-based rent. No negotiation or agreement from the leaseholder is required. That said, the city don't need to signal their intent and or end the leases until five years are left on the existing lease. This situation provides little security for the future of the community or for housing for the residents of False Creek South. As Larry mentioned of the 669 leaseholders, about two thirds of them have joined the society and made it their sole bargaining agent. Where are we at today? Well, City Council passed a motion in 2012, nine years ago, calling for the resolution of police issues. And have passed motions again and again since then to do so. The processes though, since then have delayed moving forward and no negotiations of any kind have taken place. The latest process was a sudden need to hold a public engagement on city owned lands in Falls Creek South and create a development plan. The engagement portrayed the land as a blank slate, an area that should be evaluated by the city purely as a landowner. This is an important point because that is to evaluate it solely as a real estate asset, disconnecting it completely from council's role as a landowner, as the policymaker. So what role do leasehold stratas play? Leasehold strata units contribute to that mix of level housing in Falls Creek South that Sharon described so well. And leaseholders provide value to this mixed tenure community as engaged, supportive, participatory, long-term residents with a vested equity interest in the community. Community success relies on all tenures and leasehold stratus meet a need providing home ownership opportunity, as you've heard at a reduced amount from freehold stratus, for essential service workers and families. But this depends on having security for the future of the community and for homes. Leasehold stratas are not the same kind of housing as freehold stratas. As has been mentioned, because they're on leased land, they are more affordable and they contribute financially to the city on a sustained basis through market rent payments. And again, those rents are market-based rents. There's no subsidized rents. 
and it's that money supports all tenures for affordable housing in the city of Vancouver. Another point to uh, make would be the, well, the lease rent supports affordable housing. The property taxes paid by strand leaseholders are based on a freehold value. So what's the challenge? Uh, twofold. First, affordability of family-friendly housing is deteriorating. I mentioned that there are only 15 years left uh, for the shortest leases that end in 26. But the maximum amortization available for finance, for purchase or investment in the buildings is 10 years. As financial institutions take the remaining at least 15 and subtract five years from that. What this does is make it difficult to uh, get agreement to make investments in the existing buildings from existing owners. And a 10 year amortization more than doubles the monthly payment for someone to buy you from a 25 year amortization. So it's the monthly payments, not the purchase price of the leasehold strata that take the homes out of the reach of essential service workers and families. Second, security. The lack of lease extension is undermining faith in staying or moving into the community, creating great stress for those on leased land at Falls Creek South. I can provide you a few examples of, of the stress that's happened. Uh, I've spoken with people with young children that have joined the community in the last few years and they're leaving. They're stressed by the security going forward and have decided to leave the community and take their children with them. So we have a primarily older demographic moving in because most purchases are based on cash. And those that are are unable to sell or downsize. We're caring for the elderly or people that have made modifications to meet accessibility needs for household fear having to move. So we've got a conundrum here of the demographic miss, mix of the community moving toward, towards elderly people that have cash moving in, people with young children moving out, and this is taking away from the entire premise of, of the community and moving to be. So what's the opportunity? The city could act now to protect and restore affordability for these existing 669 homes. And they could also get funds to put additional housing on undeveloped city-owned land in Falls Creek South. Our proposal we call the simple plan is for lease extension, is to the city to use its unilateral authority to extend the existing leases to the standard 99 year term. That would bring it in line with city-owned lands, Champlain Heights, Fraser View, Vancouver Art Gallery, as well as things at UBC and Simon Fraser University. Lease extensions can immediately restore that financeability and as such affordable homes, most of which are two and three bedroom homes given when they were built. Prepayment of the 39-year extension to take us from 60 to a full 99-year lease would generate an estimated $120 million for the city. This could fund as many as 335 new non-market housing units on undeveloped city land. That could be if matching funding was available from other uh, sources of government. And I can only emphasize what you've already heard is that growth is accepted in Falls Creek South, it's wanted in Falls Creek South, and most people and families would be welcome in Falls Creek South. Extensions will also provide allowing leaseholders to participate in community planning, which has been stalled since the 18th and support not opposed to Falls Creek South and the surrounding areas. So thanks very much. And I'll next we'll hear from Maria. Maria. Thanks, Richard. And thanks everybody for attending the, the Lunch and Learn today. It's my first and it's been super interesting so far hearing everybody and, and your bracketing of the issues, Larry. Um, I'm on the board at Falls Creek Housing Co-op. Um, and We've been dealing the last two weeks or have been fraught with tension as understatement. So what I'm presenting today is not what I would have presented two weeks ago because as many of you, um, sorry, I was supposed to turn my cell phone off and I didn't. Sorry about that. Um, uh, presentation has come out differently because the city methodology for um, determining these frameworks for co-op came out, it landed a few days ago and it's created more uncertainty for the co-ops in this community rather than uh, it, more certainty, which we had all been hoping for and which we've been working towards for the last 10 years. Richard talked about um, the motion that was passed unanimously by council in 2012 to create more certainty for all leaseholders down here, including the co-ops. And here we are almost 10 years later and we still don't know um, sort of the direction that we can move forward together with the city on. Um, the authorized working group 
cluster of co-ops in Falls Creek South consists of seven co-ops right now. Almost one in four uh, residents that live in a co-op on city lands belong in Falls Creek South. So that's almost 25% of us didn't get covered with clarity in this lease framework. We've been meeting bi-weekly, um, but I think when we started in 2013, none of us had any idea that we'd still be doing this all of these years later. It's been a lot of work. Um, it's been a lot of ups and downs. It's been a lot of unpredictability for us. Um, and it's been years of reports from the city, meetings with city staff, you know, all in good faith trying to move this forward. Um, more council motions, uh, more movement forward, and yet we're still at the very beginning of this process. It's 10 years on, and we've got two co-ops whose leases come up. Uh, Marina Co-op near the government wharf, uh, they're, they're up in just a few months and Creekview Co-op, which is the eight story co-op at the entrance to Granville Island, theirs comes up in December, 2023. And we're not really sure. Uh, the intent seems to be that they'll be getting some short-term lease extensions, but the framework of that isn't certain. And both of those buildings um, have a lot of work sort of that their, their boards would like to move on to. Um, as a director at my co-op, um, having this come out has been really difficult because we're making our lease payments as a co-op. We've made our full mortgage payments. Uh, we're looking after a building envelope. We just began a huge project uh, that landed in the middle of this pandemic. We've got a lot of aging members that we're trying to look after, and we're dealing with the reality of um, a mixed income housing community in the middle of a pandemic. And then to have all of this lease, sort of the uncertainty and the hard work, and we've been in full mode on this for the last 14 months since the proposed methodology was first uh, released in January 2020. It's been impactful on my community and the people who are here. 17% of our household members uh, have household incomes of under $30,000 a year. 15 of our households have incomes of under $60,000 a year. We've got double the number of single parent households compared to the city living in co-ops. We've got double the number of seniors and that number is going up. Um, and we've made a commitment not only to protecting the, the income mate we've got right now, which is stable, robust, inclusive, and it's around us. It's a heart of the community that we've got. Um, we're committed to funding the kind of housing that we've got. It's, it's a successful, robust model. People belong. Um, it's income blind. We've got some areas where I think we can do better, but it's 2021. Let's pull in some 2021 uh, metrics to think about where we can move forward as a community. And I think that this was the thing that made me the saddest when this lease framework landed, because I don't know how many more years our community is gonna to have to be talking about this, our co-ops in terms of the leases. We really wanna protect uh, the short-term lease co-ops. I know that's top of my agenda as part of the authorized working group and getting clarity from city staff as to how we can do that uh, with co-ops. And I want us to really, we need to be moving forward in a collaborative relationship with the city. We've been talking for 10 years about the need, we know it, affordable housing. Um, we need it now. We need more seniors housing. Um, and that traction kind of just, I, I, we're going to keep going, but I feel like there's been kind of a pause here as we try to look after our communities during this really, it's a difficult time in which um, housing opportunities for people who live and work in Vancouver, that those, those difficulties have become exacerbated along with income. Um, and we would like to help mitigate that. And we'd like to do it in a, a, in a community that's welcoming and in which people feel like they're really a part of. Um, if you want to get sort of a flavor of, of what it's like to live in co-ops right across the city, there was some really incredible testimony at the council meeting that's been recorded and put online. Um, we had 60 speakers come forward to talk about their experiences as co-op community members. Uh, people were in tears. There were counselors who were visibly moved. And at the very end, one counselor said that he wants to live in a co-op, <laughs> his next form of housing. So this is, it's, it's not just delivering numbers. We deliver heart and belonging as well as a community. Um, so I love us to be moving forward with more clarity so that we can work collaboratively with the city and, and broader citizens of the city. Thanks. Well, Thank you to all three speakers. I think that's been very informative, um, very open in terms of what you've been talking about. Lori, I'd like to invite you into our conversation now to help us curate some of the questions that have been coming from, uh, from the audience. And I've seen some of them. I'd, I wanna start though, while, while you're putting that together, Lori, I, I, I wanna start by going back to Sharon from the beginning and ask you a very simple question, Sharon. What, what kind of security has the city 
provided to all of you as households, but also to your homes, as they have now said they need to start this policy process, this planning process. It obviously started already a few years ago and it's gonna continue for years. Have they given you a clear, a clear security as, as uh, families and homes? Uh, what's the situation? The short answer to that will be nothing. There has been, in fact, on the contrary, uh, despite the fact that through our replan committee that we have been at this for eight, nine, ten years, um, we are no closer now to have anything resembling a definitive response to the, the uncertainty that, uh, that hangs over all of us. And that uncertainty is absolutely palpable. People ask me all the time, all, all the time, what is the plan? What is the city plan for us? <laughs> and they've moved away from wondering if they can afford the, uh, the lease renewal. Everyone knows that in the lease renewal, of course, people will pay for it. Um, to, uh, could, they, could they be planning to not renew the leases? Could they be planning to deep six this community, as it were? And, and in everything that we can do in our, in our own enclave, that, that uncertainty hangs over our heads. In my own enclave, we recently replaced the um, membrane in the garage roof. Uh, well, it has a 30-year <laughs> year warranty, wow. at least. And, uh, um, but we had to have these soul-searching decisions about whether or not people dig deep to be able to afford to do that. And, Remember, like my strata is 2036, as most enclaves are 2036 at least expiry date. Uh, to amortize a, a loan or a mortgage, you get a maximum of 10 years. And so that informs everything that we do. But I, I, I have to say unequivocally, I'm afraid that there has been not only no guarantee at all of any kind of continuing, uh, continuing security, but all the messages have been completely to the contrary. And, and I hate to say this from someone who represents an association where one of our objectives in our bylaws is to maintain a positive working relationship with the city. That, uh, it, that has to be a two-way street and I'm afraid it isn't right now. I'm, I'm kind of surprised that the, the city council wouldn't just pass a motion that says the existing city have security no matter what policy or plans or lease renewal terms or whatever uh, comes up. I was kind of surprised to, to uh, hear that. But I want to move to a second question, then I'm going to turn it over to Lori. But this one, is, Maria, is to you uh, and maybe to Richard. Um, I noticed a couple of people said in the chat, they were saying, um, well, you know, it's an older community. This doesn't seem to be available to younger people. I understood that through your planning process, one of the things you were targeting to, in fact, uh, include a lot more younger people opportunity to live and uh, own and rent in the community. And secondly, Maria, too, I, I understood that one of the things about co-ops is that it does accommodate younger families uh, with, with children. You talked about single, family, single parent families. Could you both comment on, the, on this? I, I just don't see you as a community that's um, happy with the fact that you're aging as a community. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, the demographic analysis that we've done, it's shown it over the last long time is that people who move here stay here. And that's a largely a result of this being such a successful community and people being comfortable here. And there's no other place like Falls Creek. Um, the research that sort of that we've done a little while, I noticed that there are some questions in the stream about statistics and the city stats are being quoted, which are misleading. Um, we've also done a community semi-custom poll of the 2016 uh, census data and we disaggregated leaseholds. We have some numbers that just do leasehold residents and households. We took the freehold out because the citywide stuff has a large number of freehold units included in it, which distorts things. Uh, the community is a pretty good reflection of the broader city. Um, and we have a lot more families in our, in our community um, uh, than shows up in the stats. So we actually have a percentage higher of young, uh, sorry, families as in Falls Creek South than across the city as a whole. Um, one of the things that I love co-ops is that uh, we don't sort of, 
look at income in terms of affordability with housing. If you look at all of the, the recent city stats and also the new bills that they're targeting, those are targeted towards uh, families that are earning 80 to $150,000 or over $150,000. And we've got a lot of low income families in our units as well. It's just family size uh, that determines eligibility. Um, and last, one of the things that we would love to do, and we tried to get on with this in the late 2000s and there was no uptake from the city, is contributing actively in terms of planning and finance possibly for building new seniors housing, which is much needed. It's needed across the city, but I think I calculated by um, 2036, over 43% of our residents may be seniors. If we can build new seniors housing in the community so that members can age in place, that'll free up family housing down here in the Creek. 80% of our units are two, three and four bedroom units that are not only suitable for families physically, but in terms of the community, it's a great place to raise kids. So I'm hoping future families can also raise their kids here like I have. Richard, do you wanna to add to that? Uh, yes, please, thanks, Larry. Uh, just to pick up on what Maria just said again, most of the strata units I mentioned are two and three bedroom units which would be very suitable for families. And again, the financing is what's been some more elderly people from actually downsizing and freeing up those family homes that are so close to the city core. To come back to the issue of, of the uh, short lease term remaining and the impact on the mortgages and financing, what we did was we came up with an example over the last couple of years of strata units that sold at $400,000 through $900,000 at each, each $100,000 mark. We then took two essential workers, a firefighter and a healthcare services worker, took their incomes and looked at what they could afford with a 25-year mortgage versus a, versus a 10-year mortgage. And it took them, depending on where they were in that band, from being able to afford any of those to not being able to afford any of those. So it's, it's an absurd situation where uh, it's stopping people from selling and it's stopping people from buying. It, and just coming back to, I think your question was, of course, there should be more and we want more families in the community, but there's this huge barrier to that happening with completely viable, affordable homes. It's, uh, it's absurd. Thank yeah, you, sir. Yeah. Lori, why don't you bring some of the uh, audience into our conversation? Thank you, Larry. And thank you, Sharon, Maria, and Richard. We've had, uh, first of all, to the audience, thank you for the comments that are being here. Many of you are sharing information about what's going on, and that in and of itself is very helpful to the dialogue we're having. But we have a question from Diane, Diane which is a very generic question that the, uh, the three of you have been actively involved for a long time in your communities. Being. So the question is this, why in your view is the city stalling? What is preventing resolution? Maybe each one of you could take a turn and we'll start with you, Sharon, then Maria, then Richard. So why is the city stalling? Um, you know, I, I sometimes, the, the city right now, as you know, has sent out the survey that the city as landlord. Uh, and in that, uh, they asked, they refer to this uh, Falls Creek South as Falls Creek South lands. And the whole premise of the survey is, is, is as if this were a piece of raw land belonging to the city. A reference to housing units without a reference to the fact that, that those housing units are what we call homes and there are almost 4,000 of us who live here and who have lived here for a long time and who have been excellent stewards of the uh, property that, that we do lease. Um, I wish the city would act as if it does own the land. That is to say, right now, everybody knows that the Vancouver housing market is broken. It is broken. There is no relationship between housing and incomes in the city. The, the city appears to act as if they are, they have to be within that broken model. They have to look at this and in the, in the, they look at Falls Creek, one big fat cash cow. And the question comes, what, what turn that we can get on on these lands what could we and implicit what is the future of false creek lands that would allow us to have that uh, that return now every city council has to be physically uh, physically responsible there's no question about it but when false creek south was created the the city council of the day had a financial objective it was to break even it was not to lose money it was, and in fact, they, they actually made a little money in the process. 
city council has that authority to to do that the, larry raised the question why are they not and i i, can't, I cannot answer that but i think the fundamental problem is that city council does not or the city rather is not acting as if it actually owns the land and it does not have to go hat in hand to a, a, the owner of private property to try to squeeze a few units out of an otherwise affordable development Thank maria you. what what would they it's a really good question i don't know um, I have I, ideas. It, it's a complex creature, city. The, who is the city? Who's running it? Who are we speaking to? Who's in charge? Who is the city for? I see this. It's, we're hinging on an existential moment about housing and who gets to live here in the future. And I don't know that I can, there's a simple answer for that. But I do know that I believe that the future of the city is intricately tied with people who live and work here. And I'd like to see housing as a right for everybody to access. And I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know that it can be simply answered. Is it, is it true, uh, this is a part of this question, but is it true, I, I heard someone say that the city had had someone privately do a plan that tripled or quadrupled the density and had high rises all over the community. Is that true? And is, is that what the city's concerned about? Is that what Sharon is saying? I'm, I'm just not sure of those facts. I don't know that to be a fact. I, 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 I fear that the information we get comes in, in dribbles and it's hard to know uh, what you can actually rely on. I do think part of the, that this has taken so long is that while there's been a sincere support from councils since 2012 to resolve the matter, uh, I think there's a lot of trepidation about bringing it up. Uh, I, I think there's a fear of of, uh, of moving forward and uh, not making a mess of it. So, and then of course they're, you know, they're facing a, a, a housing crisis if you want to call it that. So I, uh, but I agree with what Sharon said that I think if they view themselves as the landowner, there's this huge opportunity right in front of them. It's their land, right? They have the leases. They have, uh, I've lived in, 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 in other parts of the lower mainland and in Alberta. This is the most cooperative engaged community I've ever seen in my life. We're the most willing dance partner you could find. But over the last few years, we, we built the dance hall. We offered to pay for the dance lessons. We're, 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 we're ready to go. We're ready to welcome people in. So I, I wouldn't want to put anything past rumor, but I think it's kind of a conundrum between sincerely wanting to do the right thing. And I fear to say this with this last public engagement, um, staff having decided what they want to do, trying to bolster that that position. Well, I must say my, um, my experience has been that the councils, regardless of political party, have been trying to do the right thing um, on most of the issues of our city. So I'm hoping that that's what we'll start to see in the next few months, the right thing. I hope we'll see something to give you security, something to uh, offer those parts of you who are lower uh, than typical incomes to have a, a bridge forward and the rest of you to have a logical uh, pattern forward. Laurie, other questions? Yes, thank you. Here's one that uh, is open to any of you and it's a, it's a series of questions together from Stephen. A number of people have asked related questions like this. In the event, and to the extent you can answer this, in the event the city does move to re renew the leases but the terms of the lease prove to be unaffordable uh, to a resident, and the resident refuse to renew, what comes next for that resident? Let's just start with that one. Who'd like to try that one? Uh, I, I, I think can, Richard. I can speak for the Stratus. The um, city of Vancouver with the existing leases have the universal right to extend the lease. They don't need the leaseholders agreement. Uh, the, the existing lease spells out the, mar the market rent would be continued to be paid for an extension. Um, so the, the leaseholder uh, their only option would be uh, would be to wait till 2036 or 2046, uh, uh, move in the interim, or, or then take on the monthly the monthly rent. So there's no there's no right by the strata leaseholder to reject the extension from the city or the terms of payment for that extension. But uh, Richard, I understood what the question more was mm -hmm. that um, if people could not afford the terms 
what's going to happen to them 100 like simple simple reaction what's going to happen to them if they can't afford the terms well the proposal that we put forward as, as options would be that if you get to that extension and you don't have the monies available that you would be allowed to defer the payment for the extension until there was a sales transaction until you left the community and then it would have to be dealt with when you sold and that could be either you choosing to leave the community or and I don't want to be dark about it or it could be I don't know a polite way to put this uh, as part of an estate discussion so we we've, we've tried to suggest to the city in the same way as people over a certain age are allowed to defer their property taxes that there be the ability to defer uh, dealing with the uh, monetary amount of the extension until uh, you were you were you were leaving the world and that would presumably take that pressure off them but not take that financial uh, monies that are coming to the city away from them they captured it the, but richard that's that's your proposal is that the city's proposal the city haven't made uh, any proposal of any kind to us to uh, extensions or do well that's not fair for one strata they did give a 10 year extension they did offer a, a prepayment program but so, they they asked leaseholders to surrender their lease and values so i'm sorry to push this a little further but i know a lot of people have been asking about this Am I right that if a leaseholder comes to the end of their lease, they're offered terms to expand them, expand that, they can't afford it. Am I right that their only option is really to leave? Currently, if they, they were have unable rights. to- Do they, they have rights as sitting tenants or must they leave? Uh, um, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I guess I should be careful here, but they, uh, the current one, if they were, it would, it would be there with ability to start making monthly payments for the extension. So I, as far as I know, there's no uh, way to exempt yourself from that. And hopefully right. our lawyer hopefully our lawyer isn't online and won't be whacking me on the side of the hedge for <laughs> um, I, I, While Laura, you're looking at your next question, I wanna come back to a group we have about very much today, and that is the one third or so nonprofit buildings, uh, enclaves that are housing people with special needs, social housing for low-income folks. Um, what is their status? Or is the city just going to automatically renew them? I mean, it would seem logical since, uh, since social housing is something we all need as much as we can possibly get in the city. Is the city just those leases or what have they told you? If, if uh, I can, Sharon? if I can respond to that, am I muted here? Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know the particulars about that. How did that Sorry. But, um, God, I put a do not disturb, but they they don't believe me in any of them. Sorry. What always happens is when it's your turn to speak, the phone always rings. I, I swear that I have do not disturb. <laughs> but in, it, in any of them, it's... Um, uh, what I, I did want to say about that is that they, the nonprofits, of course, are, are in the same fix as the rest of us. What the city plans to do with them, I don't know. But we do know that one of them, and that is Broadway Lodge, which is a long-term care facility, is very, very much interested in creating what we call, what they call, a campus of care in the community that would be an integration of senior housing and and quite new forms of long-term care, not the warehousing model that unfortunately exists. Um, that, uh, that is certainly a, a, a very live possibility. And we, you know, we have so much capacity in Salt Creek South in the sense of human capacity. And we know because we, we know the people who have looked into this, who have design, can design it, can, can cost it and so on, that this is very, very, very doable. So that's one, one option, one option for, for them. But otherwise, um, otherwise, that one I know is very, we're very alive to that stuff. Other than that, um, they, I think they would have to they individually speak for themselves. We have amount of non-market rental here and, uh, and hopefully that they'll be, it will be retained in some way. Okay, I wonder if we're close to the end of the time and I wonder if we could do something a little bit different that might be fitting for the end. If I ask each of you just to, the, the general question is, if there was one thing that the city did here, what would it be? And I'll start with, again, we're very limited for time. So just a quick off the cuff answer and Maria, 
turn then Richard and then we'll uh, do some closing. Maria. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Laurie? I missed the last part because my sorry, the off. question is if if the city did one thing to help False Creek South, what should it be? Transparent collaborative process. It's all about process. I think that we've got really great people, so many great minds. We're in agreement about where we need to go. And if we could less siloing and more collaboration, I think that would be great. Thank you, Maria. Sharon. Mute, Sharon. I would like to be more original, but I agree so wholeheartedly with Maria that I would just simply second that motion. Thank you. And Richard. I'd agree too. The only thing I would add is something that Mary made mention too would be commit to security for the community and for the all the tenures going forward in terms of extensions. Uh, expand the use of this model. Boom. Thank you so much. Larry, do you have a closing comment before I closing comment on behalf of the university? Oh, it looks like we've been trying. Larry mentioned at the very beginning there were some potential problems with his link, and it looks like it happened, but at least he got to almost the very end. So let me close with a few thank yous as we come up against one o'clock. Uh, first of all, thank you to my colleagues who make SFU Vancouver's Lunch and Learn run so smoothly. That's Flavia, Sophie, and Claudio. Thank you so much for this. Secondly, thank you to our guest presenters, Sharon, Richard, and Maria. Thank you so much for taking the time, the preparation, and the obvious to your neighborhood that you're showing today. Thank you so much. Thank you to Nathan Edelson, another False Creek South resident who's done so much work behind the scenes. We wouldn't have this even if it wasn't for Richard. Uh, Nathan. And also thank you, of course, to Larry Beasley. Uh, Larry has devoted his time, his expertise, and his interest in False Creek South to be with us today as well. So thank you for that. And for all of you, the over 100 people who along today to take part in this, I want to let you know we're having a second session sometime in September when we know the city's response and when we have the city come along to present and be part of the discussion. We will place information about that on the SFU Vancouver website and on all of our social media platforms as well. Thank you so much for being here today. And I hope you will come and join again for SFU Vancouver's Lunch and Learn. Bye-bye for now.